It is time for questions to the Executive Office. I uh, would advise members that question 7 has been withdrawn. And I call Jerry Carl to ask the first question. Jerry Carl. Question number one. Uh, over this past year, Mr. Speaker, we have worked continuously to put measures in place to curb the spread of the virus in Northern Ireland. A zero COVID-19 strategy would, would require a five nations approach to collectively close our borders with other countries. Our response as an executive and recovery from COVID-19 will continue to be focused on the health and well-being of our citizens, our economic well-being and revitalising the economy and our societal and community well-being. The restrictions implemented are there to help reduce the spread of coronavirus and to help manage the pressures on our health and social care system. In making decisions, the executive considers three key criteria the most up-to-date medical and scientific evidence, the ability of the health service to cope, and the wider impacts on our health, society and economy. Every proposal to change restrictions that comes before the executive has been reviewed by the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor. They attend executive meetings and give their advice directly to us. Following the increase in coronavirus cases, the executive agreed the current restrictions on the 17th of December. We moved quickly to put in place measures to reduce the spread of the virus and help manage the pressures on our health and social care system. We have continued to keep the restrictions under review and took the decision on the 21st of January to extend these restrictions until the 5th of March, and we will review them again on the 18th of February. The single most important action we can all take is to stay at home. The Executive places a particular emphasis on people and families, as we know how important this is to everyone. Any future Executive decisions will therefore be informed by the impact they may have on us as individuals, families and the wider communities within which we all live, and will be necessary and proportionate. Since the current regulations were put in place on the 26th of December, we have been encouraging it, we have been encouraged that the majority of people are adhering to them and that they are doing their utmost to help limit the spread of COVID-19. This can clearly be seen in the, following, in the falling R number and the reduction in the number of positive cases. However, the pressure on our hospitals will remain for some time and as such, we cannot be complacent. Well, Jerry Carl for supplementary. Thank you. It's widely regarded that the executive's handling of this pandemic has been catastrophic, and you compare it with other countries uh, who have had a low number of deaths return to normal uh, somewhat as they have developed a zero COVID approach. Many hope lessons will be learned. Uh, I remain unconvinced. Professor Mark Schreim has said if the pandemic was like a cancer, the government have adopted the essential oils approach, perfunctory, half measures, and wishful thinking. That's true here. Given that, will the First Minister commit to engaging with those advocating for a zero COVID strategy and commit uh, to adopting one uh, on this island with their counterparts in the South as well? Well, I thank the member for his questions. Of course, we haven't uh, been taking advice from quacks, as I think he is indicating. We've been taking advice from the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor, and indeed from SAGE uh, in the United Kingdom. As I've already indicated in my substantive answer, uh, a zero COVID approach would only work on a five nations basis. Uh, I am pleased to say, in terms of the quarantine, that we are working in that regard, and hopefully that will help in relation to the problems with international travel. Call Colin Gilderney. But, um, Minister, it's clear that, uh, First Minister, it's clear that COVID-19 does not recognise borders, and which speaks very much to the need for enhanced collaboration and working together. Can the Minister outline the practical benefits of an all-island cooperation in managing our response to the public health emergency? Well, I would absolutely be delighted if we could have cooperation from the Republic of Ireland's government in relation to data sharing, um, Mr. Speaker. I mean, we've been very disappointed uh, about the way in which this has been approached. Um, we're told there's a problem from the Attorney General of the Republic of Ireland, and then we're told it's another problem with the Commissioner for Information. I would have thought that if we want to try and make sure that we deal with COVID in a proper way, that we should be sharing the information. And uh, we again will raise this issue with the Republic of Ireland's government. But I have to say, in our last meeting, I was very disappointed uh, that uh, Simon Coveney, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, was again hiding behind some reason or other as to why it couldn't be done. It's a very straightforward matter. The Minister of Health has been looking for this information now for coming on 11 months. Uh, and I think it's about time that it was sorted out. I call Carol Hunter. 
Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the First Minister for her answer so far. Can I ask the First Minister for her assessment of the mental health uh, impact of lockdowns and what cross-departmental approach will be taken to mitigate this? I do thank the member for her question. It's something that we're very conscious of, uh, particularly for our young people with the closure of schools and the fact that they're not having um, that uh, interaction with their peers that they're so used to having on an ongoing basis. Also concerned in relation to isolation of older people and the fact that they are not having the contact that they usually would have. So, uh, as the member will know, we set up a cross-departmental uh, mental health group under the chairmanship of the Minister of Health uh, shortly after we came back uh, into government again. Um, I think it was February, March time last year, before COVID actually hit us as, as, a, as a nation. So it is important that we continue to work through that. I know that the Minister of Health is very much aware of the mental health crisis that unfortunately awaits us after we have dealt with these COVID issues, but we're trying to do all that we can to support people uh, as we go through COVID, but we are recognising that more funding will need to be made available uh, after this COVID pandemic has passed through. I call Alan Chambers. Speaker, uh, and thank you, First Minister, uh, uh, for your answers so far. Uh, unfortunately, we, we may have to live with COVID for many years to come, and we'll all have to continue to make personal sacrifices. But what mechanisms will be put in place to address localised outbreaks in the future? Well, I think the member will remember that when we started through uh, restrictions, we did begin with localised uh, restrictions. Uh, and unfortunately, that didn't work because we are quite a small jurisdiction, and therefore um, the, the movement of people in any way spreads the coronavirus. And therefore, that we find ourselves in a situation uh, where we had to uh, take nationwide uh, approach to the restrictions. Uh, I think the testing will perform quite a useful tool for us moving forward. Uh, I note today in England that uh, all employers who have employees of more than 50 can now apply for uh, testing kit, uh, kits, rapid testing kits, and then they can follow that up with uh, PCR tests after that. So it's something that I think we need to consider, particularly for those employers who have uh, the, food preparation, those, those places where COVID spreads quite rapidly, often in an asymptomatic way that people don't actually realise that they have COVID. So testing will form very much part of the strategy, I think, moving forward as well, of course, uh, as the vaccine, which continues to be rolling out in Northern Ireland uh, in a very professional way. And I do want to pay tribute to the work of the vaccination team for everything that they're doing here in Northern Ireland. Nicole Nicola Brogan. The Shared Island Fund is a Republic of Ireland government initiative with €500 million Euros to be made available through to 2025. The fund provides capital funding for investment on a strategic basis in collaborative uh, North Northern Ireland Republic of Ireland projects that will support agreed cross-border cooperation. The Executive is working with the ROI Government, including through the North South Ministerial Council, to consider where the Shared Island Fund may contribute to our emerging programme for government outcomes and deliver mutual benefit in both jurisdictions. We also discussed the fund at the North South Ministerial Council Institutional Meeting in December, and our officials are working with ROI Government counterparts to explore how the fund might operate and where it would contribute to our programme for government priorities. We have discussed with the ROI Government some of their priorities for such investment, including infrastructure initiatives such as the A5, the Ulster Canal, the Narrow Water Bridge, and cross-border greenways, including the Sligo to Inniskillen Greenway, achieving greater connectivity, including, for instance, examining the feasibility of high-speed rail connections, new investment and development opportunities in the northwest and border communities, supporting cooperation between both jurisdictions in the area of research and innovation, and exploring a joint approach to environmental issues to tackle climate breakdown and the biodiversity crisis. Nicola Brogan, supplementary. I thank the First Minister for her answer. Does the Minister agree with me that targeted investment and collaborative working between the Executive and the Dublin Government, government is key to delivering future opportunity and prosperity along the border corridor? Well, I thank the member for her question. Of course, we were disappointed that when this uh, shared island fund was announced that there was uh, no um, 
communication with the executive about how uh, this would be brought forward. It was announced without consultation uh, with the executive. However, we will continue to speak with the Republic of Ireland's government through the North South Ministerial Council uh, to, to see whether we can have our programme for government outcomes align uh, with their objectives, which they have set out uh, in their shared island uh, agenda. Thank you. Uh, I welcome the commitment from the Irish Government to invest in the all-island infrastructure. I note that at the recent uh, NSMC funding was confirmed for the Ulster Canal that runs through uh, my constituency of Lagan Valley. Can the Minister provide an update on the Executive Office's commitment to ensure the Executive funding for the infrastructure flagship as promised by uh, New Dacket New Approach? Thanks to the member <coughs> excuse me, for his uh, question. Um, he may be disappointed to know that phase one is actually from the upper lock in my constituency to Castle Saunderson, um, but I do recognise that uh, if it were to roll on to completion, it would go right across uh, into his own uh, constituency. Phase one of the restoration comprises 2.45 kilometres of new navigation uh, from Upper Lock Air near Quivy Lock uh, along the River Finn to a new boating destination at Castle Saunderson. He may know that Castle Saunderson is run by the Scout Association, so it's actually a, a very good uh, initiative. Um, that was opened in late 2019, and as a result of that, we're now moving on to phase two of the restoration, which includes approximately 800 metres of canal and associated towpaths, construction of a canal, a canal basin and amenity area in Clonus. Um, um, which, of course, is very close to, to my constituency as well. And then the remaining section of the canal restoration uh, will connect Castle Saunderson to Clonfad and uh, thereby link the town of Clonus uh, to, to Loch Erne. This is um, obviously uh, a long uh, and complicated piece of work. Uh, I do recognise the interest in it from right across Northern Ireland, and uh, I'm sure we're happy to keep the House updated in relation to uh, how this uh, moves along. I think it has the potential uh, to be a nice piece of tourism infrastructure uh, along an area which, frankly, doesn't have much tourism infrastructure, so it will be welcomed. Call Jim Allister. First Minister, given the genesis of the Shared Island Fund, do you not think that, in part, it is a sugar coating of an ambition to ultimately absorb this part of the United Kingdom into a 32 county republic? And when you refer to it being processed during the North South Ministerial Council, where does that now sit? with your publicised intention to not fully function the North-South institutions rightfully in protest against the thrashing of the East-West relationships through the protocol? Well, as I think I've already indicated uh, to the House, the Shared Ireland Fund, um, somewhat ironically, was set up without any consultation uh, with the Northern Ireland Executive, and so it is the Shared Ireland Fund of the Republic of Ireland's government. I think that's the first thing to say. Of course, he will also be familiar with the Union Connectivity Review that is currently ongoing by Sir Peter Hende, and he is uh, consulting as to how he can... Um, make the United Kingdom more connective, so looking at issues like the A75 and the A77 in Scotland, which I'm sure he's familiar with when he takes the boat to Cairn Ryan and the difficulties there are in that road uh, infrastructure. So there, there is a lot of work going on on connectivity at present. I welcome that. I think it is important that we are connected uh, right across the British Isles, and that's something that I'm going to continue to work on. I call Chris Little. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question three. The Executive is fully committed to the development of an outcomes-based programme for government as the basis for tackling entrenched and complex social problems and improving quality of life conditions for all. The COVID pandemic has demonstrated very clearly the interconnectedness of economic and social policy and has sent a powerful reminder to us all of the need for a whole-of-government approach when it comes to public service planning and delivery. Our new programme for government puts collaboration and inclusivity to the fore building on the commitment and unity of purpose we have in the Executive to work in partnership with wider society to improve the well-being of all. 
We launched the public consultation for the programme on the 25th of January, and this will run for eight weeks. We hope to be in a position to have a final version of the framework agreed by the Executive by around the end of April, with a view to bringing forward a complete programme incorporating key actions and strategies before the summer. Chris Little, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her update on, on work on that programme for government. Can I ask the First Minister what accountability structures are currently in place to report on progress on the programme for government outcomes, and if she supports the establishment of an assembly programme for government committee, as proposed by the new decade, new approach to enhance cross-departmental reporting and accountability on outcomes. So, as I said, uh, we are hoping to uh, have the programme for government consulted on and then come forward by the end of April. I think that is the target date, and we very much hope to meet that, although we do ex- accept that, given uh, the COVID restrictions, that, that is somewhat uh, difficult. However, that is uh, the target at present. Uh, in relation to the commitment to establish an Assembly programme for government monitoring committee, um, that is, of course, uh, set out in the New Decade, New Approach document. But it is a matter for the Assembly uh, to create such a committee, Mr Speaker. Uh, we, of course, in TEO will provide any uh, support that may be needed uh, from the Executive or indeed from our officials leading on the programme for government uh, development process. But again, as I say, that is entirely a matter for the Assembly. Well, Colin McGrath. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, could I ask the First Minister what the um, sort of principal policy areas will be within the new programme for government? Well, as he knows, uh, we have set out uh, an action plan which uh, we had uh, consulted on. Uh, we're looking at our children and young people to make sure that they have the best start in life. I think, given the restrictions our young people in particular have been under uh, since the COVID pandemic uh, came to Northern Ireland, that uh, they have been under incredible pressure. So we want to put an emphasis on children and young people. We also want to work and live sustainably, again, uh, looking to see if we can build back better uh, from the pandemic, protecting the environment. We do, of course, want to have an equal and inclusive society where everyone is valued and treated with respect, that we all enjoy long, healthy, active lives. Everyone can reach their potential. I think that's a very important point, given what we've come through, that our economy is globally competitive, regionally balanced and carbon neutral, that everyone feels safe and that we all respect the law and each other and uh, that we have a caring society that supports people throughout their lives. Those are the key elements uh, of the programme for government, Mr Speaker, which is currently out for consultation. I call Chris uh, Mr Speaker, sir, um, given the vast scale of the public debts that are being run up, it is going to be essential that we have a strong economy coming out of the COVID restrictions. Can the First Minister outline for the House whether or not Building a strong economy will be the central feature of the programme for government. And before I sit down, I want to congratulate Mr. Middleton on his recent appointment and put that on the record of the House. Thank you. Well, on behalf of Mr. Middleton, I, I thank him for that, uh, that comment. And I think I've made an absolutely brilliant appointment. Um, but uh, to go back to his point about the economy, as I say, it's one of our uh, key uh, statements of societal well-being that our economy has to be globally competitive, regionally balanced, which I think is incredibly important, and also carbon neutral. I think what the member is speaking about is very important because our economy, and when we talk about our economy, we're to, you know, it's a macro thing that we're talking about. It's not individuals. But, Mr Speaker, our economy is made up of small and medium-sized enterprises, all of which have been under incredible pressure during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Some of them may not survive because of the COVID uh, pandemic, despite the fact that we have tried to help them with different schemes that we have put put out. So when we look at the economy, we're looking at, as well as recovery, survival. Uh, That's something that we're very keenly aware of, and we look forward to working with all of the different representative bodies to try and help uh, get Northern Ireland back to where it should be. We were on the cusp of... Uh, being globally competitive. We were doing so well in terms of some of our new sectors like cyber security, like financial technology, uh, and we really need to get back there, uh, Mr Speaker, and therefore I think that it should be very much very central in our new programme for government. Nicole Mike Nesbitt. 
<clears throat> thinking of the remarks of the Deputy First Minister yesterday about the police and the previous week Gregory Campbell talking about the skin colour of those participating in songs of praise and the reaction to it, uh, what is the First Minister's assessment of the damage this is doing to the ambition to create a society where everybody is valued and treated with respect? Yes, and uh, I say to the member that that's absolutely critical. We do have to have a caring society. Sometimes I despair at some of the things I see on our social media. I mean, people talk about being kind to each other, but I have to say sometimes that is not what I see uh, on social media or indeed in society, and I really do regret that. So we do want to create a caring society that supports people throughout their lives. Uh, for my part, uh, we are totally committed to, if he's speaking about the racial equality piece, uh, our next meeting of the subgroup uh, is this Wednesday. I very much look forward to engaging with uh, that group of representatives uh, and listening to the members and to hear the concerns uh, that they have. I call Liz Kimmins. The Executive's COVID-19 Task Force uh, ECT has been established as a necessary step change in the Executive's response to the evolving nature of the pandemic. Uh, the ECT is led by the Interim Hawks, who has convened a strategic oversight board that meets regularly. The Task Force will report to the Executive on a monthly basis. The Department provides a project management function for the Task Force. This includes practical coordination, support and alignment of the overall response to the pandemic across key operational departments. Local government, PSNI and other public sector agencies are also involved in key work streams and projects. The ECT brings together four main work streams led by senior officials in the relevant departments. Our officials lead a number of initiatives in support, including a weekly meeting of all departments, local government and the PSNI to look at the common challenges and solutions. Our officials contribute to, uh, to on a number of the work areas under each work stream. For example, we have officials supporting adherence to self-isolation and how it can be improved, face coverings and the preparation of an overall pathway out of the current restrictions. The Executive Information Service also plays a key role in the strategic communications for the task force. Most recently, our officials are leading on the overall response to risks posed by international travel. Ms. Kevin, supplementary. Gary Mel, I to thank the Minister for her answer. Um, will the Executive COVID-19 Task Force also play a role in planning for long-term um, economic recovery? And will they complete a reset of how we do economic business? Yes, thank the Member for her question. Um, the four work streams are protect, recovery, adherence and strategic comms. And in terms of the recovery piece, that's not just the short-term recovery, but also uh, the longer-term recovery. I think we're on record as saying uh, from the Executive Office that we do want to see us building back better uh, so that we can take into account all of the experience of this past year uh, and that we work together to have a fair um, economy moving forward, one that is regionally balanced, but one also that takes uh, account of uh, some of our outstanding industries, and I've already mentioned some of them, fintech, uh, cybersecurity, advanced manufacturing, all of those industries which there is great potential in, and I think our recovery uh, strategy will very much be focusing on those sorts of industries. Call Colin McGrath. Mr Speaker, um, last week at the Executive Office Committee we received an update on the High Street Task Force and whilst it is very much connected to the recovery that there is as a result of COVID, can I get an assurance from the First Minister that it will also remain a separate entity because it will be required beyond uh, COVID because many of the problems that the High Street was facing predate COVID arriving and they will be here for a long time going forward? <clears throat> Yes, and I'm, I'm happy to confirm that, that that will be the case. Um, we felt that it was important that it was part of the task force now, because if we're talking about recovery, our high streets are fundamental to that recovery, uh, particularly for our smaller towns and villages. And that's why we, we felt it should come into that structure. But I, I do absolutely take the point that this is a more fundamental issue that will go on for longer than uh, just the recovery from COVID and the challenge of the internet, uh, digital challenges, all of those 
things that we have talked about uh, on occasions will have to be worked through and uh, very much looking forward to working with all of the representative groups and trying to find answers, sustainable answers, long-term answers for our high streets. Call Paula Bradshaw. Um, First Minister, you'll be aware that last week um, the UK government um, went out to tender for managed isolation hotels uh, close to the airports and um, ferry terminals. Uh, and given the um, changing nature of the list of countries that will be banned uh, and, and moved in and out of that list, are you, um, is this task force going to move forward with tendering for some, speci- um, some um, provision here in Northern Ireland? Yeah, so thank the member for her question. Um, we have set up a task and finish group within the executive office uh, to deal with this very issue and uh, the department of health department for economy department for infrastructure and justice also uh, attends along with the central procurement directorate uh, we continue to engage with colleagues uh, in the cabinet office at a four nation discussion and of course with officials from uh, the republic of ireland's government uh, as well uh, work is ongoing on a number of issues, including uh, procurement uh, and commercials, hotel rooms and services, transport, security and welfare services. Um, They all need to be identified and and where we can put them in place. And then in terms of regulations, uh, subject to confirmation, whether it's going to be an immigration-based solution, which seems to be uh, the way in which uh, we're going at present whether there needs to be health regulation amendments brought forward. Um, We obviously need to have very key communications and engagements with the carriers. At the moment, we don't have any carriers bringing people in from that list of uh, red countries, as she understands herself. Uh, But we do need to be ready in case that does happen. Uh, And then in terms of enforcement, uh, we also need to, of course, have a, a plan Uh, as to how we're going to enforce these issues uh, if it comes to fruition. Uh, At present, uh, if people come in through either London or Dublin, the quarantining uh, will be in London and Dublin, and then people will move on into uh, Northern Ireland. And uh, we're hoping that the Irish government are going to put those arrangements in place, and we'll be engaging with them at an official level to to make sure that we have a line of sight in relation to all of that. Nicole Joanne Bundy. Mr. Speaker, question five, please. Uh, two meetings of the Joint Board took place in 2020. The meetings took uh, an overview of NDNA implementation in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as a specific focus on health and social care transformation, low emission public transport, and the potential for a meeting of the United Kingdom's Board of Trade in Northern Ireland to promote economic recovery. The next meeting of the Joint Board will take place later this month. John Bunding, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I declare my membership of the Policing Board. At the board meeting on Thursday, the Chief Constable indicated that the current draft budget would see a reduction in officers and recruitment. Will the First Minister seek to prioritise the NDNA commitment to increase police numbers, as this is something that should benefit the whole of society? Uh, I very much welcome the member's question. This is an issue upon which I spoke to the Secretary of State this morning. Um, about the fact that it had been indicated that there wasn't the funding for the extra police officers and he and I will continue to have conversations about that. I think it's absolutely critical uh, that instead of a reduction of police numbers we actually see an increase in the number of police officers on the ground. I think that's critical for policing confidence and to make sure that everyone in society uh, is protected and feels safe. So absolutely we will continue to raise this issue with our own government and indeed I'm sure the Justice Minister will raise it with the Finance Minister as well. Mark Durgan. So. Hey, all good. Uh, Kian Kolya, thank the First Minister for her answers thus far. Another new decade, new approach commitment on which I would like an update is the commitment to an addiction unit in Derry, the need for which has become sadly even more acute Uh, through the course of this pandemic. I'm awaiting an answer from the Health Minister on this, but will the First Minister and Deputy First Minister please uh, take this opportunity to reaffirm their commitment to this badly needed and sadly needed unit as a matter of urgency? I thank the member for raising uh, this issue. I was very struck by, I think it was Radio Ulster, um, 
piece last week around the need for the addiction services. I know uh, my colleague Gary Middleton has raised this issue with me uh, on a number of occasions and indeed, as he rightly says, it is a new decade, new approach commitment uh, and therefore something that we need to put into that discussion about prioritisation around new decade, new approach. As he knows, there's a whole range of commitments in new decade, new approach. Some of them won't be uh, able to be facilitated during this mandate. Uh, we do have to, as five parties in the executive, have that discussion about those that need to be prioritised. And I have to say, I, I do agree with them that I believe that there does need to be a priority put on the funding uh, for that addiction centre. That ends the period for a list of questions. And we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And uh, before I call Sinead Bradley, I advise members that question eight has been withdrawn. So I call Sinead Bradley. Mr Speaker, given that the Executive Office and the Office of the Joint Ministers hold responsibility for the equality and diversity policy, does the Minister agree with me that those of us in public life have a particular responsibility to take care of our words? And would she say unequivocally that racism, homophobia, and any other form of discrimination has absolutely no place in our modern society. Can I can thank the member for her question, and uh, can I absolutely concur with her? There is no place at all for uh, any of those issues that she has mentioned. I think I've already uh, said in response to Mr. Nesbitt's question that um, we are trying to build a society where everyone feels comfortable in Northern Ireland. Uh, whatever your ethnic background, whatever your sexual orientation, whatever your religion or politics, you should be able to feel comfortable living and working here in Northern Ireland. Senior Bradley, supplementary. Thank you. And I thank the First Minister for those words. And I would hope that she would use this opportunity now to distance herself from the comments made by her party colleagues, Gregory Campbell and Nelson McCausland, over the weekend. And would she be calling on them to issue a public apology in that regard? I thank the member for her supplementary. I have, uh, of course, heard some of the commentary around the issue uh, over the weekend, and clearly Gregory will speak for himself uh, later on. I understand he will do that uh, this afternoon. For my part, it's not a sentiment uh, that I identify with as someone who actually does enjoy songs of praise uh, every Sunday uh, and uh, the diversity that is exhibited thereupon. And, and as a party, let me be very clear, uh, not as First Minister but as DUP leader, we are totally, uh, absolutely committed to racial equality. Uh, and as I've indicated, the next meeting of the racial equality subgroup will take place uh, on Wednesday this week. And I very much look forward to engaging with the members of that subgroup. Call Paula Bradshaw. Mr Speaker, um, First Minister, given the, the tensions in this chamber and in wider society over the last week, what can you and the Deputy First Minister do to put peace and reconciliation back into the heart of the, our work here in the Assembly? Well, I think it's important that everybody in this uh, chamber uh, exhibits leadership around peace and reconciliation. Of course, given uh, that we have five parties in the executive, we are going to have differences of opinion uh, around a range of issues, uh, not least in relation to uh, constitutional issues. But I think it is important that we continue to have this place to have those conversations and that constitutional politics has to have primacy in everything. I think it's important that when people have concerns, uh, that they are not uh, skimmed over or ignored, but they're brought to the place uh, where those concerns should be heard, because what would be worse uh, is that things were ignored, uh, not given a voice to, and then those people who had those concerns would feel that they were completely alienated from the democratic process. So I think it's important that everyone has a voice in Northern Ireland, and the place to have that voice heard is here in this Assembly. Paula Bradshaw, supplementary. Thank you for your, for your answer, um, First Minister. Um, I'm wondering, therefore, when you will be signing off and publishing the re report from the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition. Thank you. 
Well, that work has been completed, as the member knows. I think it, uh, the date sticks in my mind because it came to us on my birthday, so I know exactly when it came to the Executive Office. The junior ministers are taking forward uh, a piece of work on that. They're meeting with the authors and, and bringing it forward. So it's not that we haven't signed off on it. It's not for us to sign off on it. It has been brought to us as a piece of work, and now the junior ministers are taking that work forward. I call Paul Frey. Do you see any reason for a difference between restrictions on special advisor roles and for other public appointments? Um, no, I think that uh, restrictions on uh, special advisors, and if he's talking about particular uh, convictions that they would hold, uh, I think that that should apply to all public appointments. Uh, and I understand that my colleague, the Minister of Education, is looking into this at present. Paul Frey, supplementary. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister then, uh, does she, is she aware of the legislative options that would be open to either the Executive or this Assembly? Uh, well, as I say, the uh, Minister of Education is looking into this matter. He uh, is going to bring a paper to the Executive on this issue. And it's important, I talked about giving voice uh, to people in my last uh, answer, it's important that I give voice to a gentleman who I spoke to on Friday afternoon. I spoke to John Radley, who is one of Paul Kavanagh's victims on Friday, who was frankly struggling to come to terms uh, with the fact that a mainstream political party would appoint someone with five life sentences to an education authority to look after the well-being of our young people. Uh, and he told me plainly that his life had been ruined and he had to live with that every single day. And that was a very powerful conversation which I had. It's now incumbent upon us to listen to that voice, and not only listen to that voice, but to act as well. Yeah. I call Patrick McLone. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, um, in relation to the current situation at the Port of Larne, has there been any further update or evaluation done through her office of what that position is? Well, as the member knows, that's the responsibility of the DERA minister, uh, and as I understand it, he has now received a risk assessment uh, from uh, the Police Service of Northern Ireland. He is working through that, and uh, he will come with a report to the executive tomorrow morning on that issue. I thank the minister for, for her uh, response to that. Um, is the minister in any way concerned that these uh, spurious types of uh, allegations that were uh, flung about the place in relation to security risk at the port would in any way damage the commercial viability of the port? Well, as I understand it, um, he may call them spurious, but I think there were enough concerns for people to act uh, proactively to try and make sure that the staff were safe, and that, of course, should always be the priority, that our staff are protected. Uh, Midney Santrum, after carrying out their own investigations and indeed uh, communicating with the Police Service of Northern Ireland, have now released their staff back to uh, the Port of Larne. And I do understand that the Minister for Agriculture will come to the Executive with his plan tomorrow, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I think it's right that Executive colleagues have the chance to consider what he has to say first. I call Christopher Salford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, two Fridays ago, the idea of the European Commission as some sort of a benign organisation with our interests at heart was exposed for the fallacy that it is when they threatened essential medical supplies, not only coming into Northern Ireland but coming into the rest of the United Kingdom. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that this intolerable situation cannot be allowed to continue into the future and they cannot be allowed to reserve the right to treat us in such a way ever again? I think the, the member is right. It was a, a bit of a Freudian slip from uh, the European Commission. We did see the true face of the European Commission. They were protecting their bloc um, and not actually looking to what was right uh, for the citizens of the United Kingdom. So it was very badly judged. Uh, I think it was uh, wrong in so many ways. The fact that you're going to use a mechanism which we were told that was only to be used in extremists uh, for a situation to stop vaccine uh, from coming into the United Kingdom through Northern Ireland 
Um, it was just baffling beyond bafflement, uh, but it's up to the European Commission uh, to make their own judgment in relation to that. But I have to say, before Friday week ago, we were told that Article 16 could only be used in extremists, and it's very clear that that's not the case when it comes to the European Commission. Mr. Stalford, supplementary. Thank you. Now that the cat is out of the bag and Article 16 has been invoked by the European side, could I remind uh, my right honourable friend of a comment made by the Prime Minister who said, we are a UK government. Why would we put checks on goods going from Northern Ireland to GB or GB to Northern Ireland? It doesn't make sense. Could I encourage the First Minister to urge the Prime Minister to perhaps try putting the Unionist back in Conservative and Unionist Party? Well, I say to the member, of course it doesn't make sense. And uh, the Prime Minister made a number of uh, promises to the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, chief amongst them, of course, was that there would be unfettered access, not just from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, but from Great Britain uh, to Northern Ireland. And that's clearly not what is happening uh, under the protocol. So therefore, uh, the Prime Minister needs to use all legal instruments at his, disposable, at his disposal uh, to deal with these issues. That's what we're calling upon him to do. Uh, he has a duty as the Prime Minister of the entirety of the United Kingdom to act in the interests of all of his citizens, uh, and therefore it's incumbent upon him to act in the very near future. Uh, can call you. Would the First Minister agree with me that the failure of the British Government to legislate for the legacy aspects of the Stormont House uh, Agreement, which it signed up to over six uh, years ago, is extremely disappointing? It fails victims across our society and is totally unacceptable. Well, I thank the member for her question. As she knows, legacy is a very contentious issue. And uh, while she may talk about uh, an agreement that was signed up to six years ago, she will also recall that there was a consultation undertook. Uh, by the then Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Karen Bradley, uh, and that there was a huge amount uh, of resistance to the Stormont House arrangements in that consultation. And therefore, we have to take into consideration the views of the victims in all of this, because, of course, there is little point in setting up a system if the very people that you are attempting to help are the people who have actually rejected it. Julian Alice, supplementary. Uh, just over two weeks ago, 3,500 bereaved families, uh, relatives of these people, actually signed an open letter through Relatives for Justice calling on the British and Irish governments to fulfil their legacy uh, commitments. So would the First Minister join with me in supporting them in this open letter? Uh, I support the victims who made their voices very clear in the consultation, Mr Speaker, and I think everybody in this House should listen to all of those uh, voices because they are very, very strong. I call Alan Chambers. Mr. Speaker, uh, I realise, Minister, that there are many parties in, the, in this House that have uh, fully supported the implementation uh, of the protocol. Uh, could I ask the Minister, would there be support across the executive uh, to now lobby the UK government to establish a UK government task force? to deal with the persistent problems that have arisen as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol? <clears throat> well, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, on any objective understanding of the operation of the Protocol, it has uh, caused huge uh, problems for many people across Northern Ireland, not just businesses, but actually citizens who are just looking for parcels to be delivered or uh, perhaps ordering pot plants uh, from Great Britain or seeds. Uh, or wanting to travel to Scotland with their dog for the weekend. I mean, there's a huge amount of problems uh, that have arisen uh, as a result of the protocol. So, therefore, I think it's incumbent upon everybody uh, to recognise that this is not just teething problems, but actually uh, there are huge problems with it, and therefore they need to be addressed. Alan Chambers, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that. Uh, are you confident, Minister, that solutions will be found? to deal with the problems that the protocol are currently causing all our citizens? Well, I say this to you, Mr Chambers, I am a, an optimist. One has to be an optimist if you're going to be in politics in Northern Ireland, otherwise you become a very bitter and twisted individual. So therefore, it is important that we try and find solutions. That's what I'm focused on, and I hope it's what everybody's focused on as well. They call Keith Archibald. Can I ask the First Minister for an update on the High Street Task Force, please? 
As I indicated in my answer to uh, Mr McGrath, the uh, High Street Task Force uh, has now not been uh, subsumed but actually conjoined to the uh, task force that's looking at COVID. Uh, we did that because we fundamentally felt uh, that if we were planning the recovery out of COVID that part of that should be the High Street Task Force uh, because of course it's not just about recovery for them, it's also about survival. So we felt it was very important that the two pieces of work were joined together. Keeva Archibald, supplementary. Um, I thank the, the First Minister for her response. And even before the pandemic, it was clear that our high streets were, were rapidly changing, and obviously that's now been accelerated. And we do need to be planning strategically for the future to better use our towns and cities um, where people can live and can afford to live and work and socialise. Does the Minister agree that environmental sustainability needs to be a core principle of the, that the task force incorporates into its work um, through, for example, promoting active and and public transport or carbon neutral buildings or green spaces that people can enjoy? So I think the member hits on a very important uh, point. This is not just a matter for the Department for the Economy or the Department for Finance, which some people think it is. It's actually a whole of government uh, approach to the high streets. So, for example, living over the shops piece, uh, which of course would be for her colleague in DFC, the Department for Infrastructure piece around public transport, around uh, uh, making sure that people have places where they want to actually live in the centre of towns and villages and cities. So it is a whole of government approach that we need in address in our problems on the high street. Of course, they predate uh, COVID, particularly with the online challenges that we have. But I think if we are imaginative and innovative, we can find new ways to uh, actually bring back life into our high streets. Thank you. And members, time is up. And could members please take a raise for a moment or two? Thank you.